Yeah, good evening, everybody. My name is Bianca Gonzalez, and I'm very excited to introduce our final webinar within our four-part autism webinar series in honor of one of our founding doctors, um, Dr. Herman H. Stone. This is the Riverside Medical Clinic Charitable Foundation's fifth annual memorial event, and we would definitely like to thank our premier sponsors and individual donors, um, the Riverside Medical Clinic, Dr. and Mrs. Joseph Sohn, Dr. and Mrs. May Olson, Dr. and Mrs. Fred Havens and Ms. Georgia Hewling, we truly appreciate your support. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will have a short Q&A session. Um, so please feel free to leave any questions or comments at the end of the presentation. Um, and this PowerPoint presentation will also be sent out to everybody um, as well after the webinar. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Ms. Randy Chapluck. Randy is the Principal of Special Education at the Riverside County Office of Education, Division of Student Programs and Services, and I will go ahead and give it away to Randy. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. I want to take a quick moment, and I'll introduce myself. Awesome. As she said, my thank name is so Randy Chamblock, and so I stumbled into the field of working with individuals with autism about 17 years ago when I was in college. Uh, I got to start out as an instructional assistant, working primarily with students who had autism. I moved from there and um, did ABA therapy with students, and it bit me, I got the passion, and I decided to become a teacher. And I wanted to teach students who had autism. So I spent time as a classroom teacher. Uh, from there, I moved into a role with another district as an autism specialist. They called it an autism program manager, where I uh, supervised programs for students with autism, I supported teams in inclusion, uh, preschool through age 22, and then uh, came back to the Inland Empire and spent some more time with students with all disabilities. And now I am one of the principals in special education with the Riverside County Office of Education. So again, thank you for the opportunity um, to be here tonight. And I was asked to come and speak about how parents can work alongside the school system in order to support children or their, their child who has autism. So that's what we're going to focus on tonight. I watched the other webinar portions and I saw that you've had some great information and people have covered what autism is, uh, how to get a diagnosis, some of the other supports and services that are available to children who have autism. And so I'm not going to repeat that information. We're going to go straight into autism in the educational environment. Oh, goodness. So we're going to start out with a true or false question. So if your child has a diagnosis of autism, that means he's going to receive specialized services at school. And this answer is false. So having a medical diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder does not mean that an individual requires specialized services or modifications to access his educational environment. That's where we're going to spend a lot of our time tonight in these questions and what's different about it. So autism in the educational setting is much different than medical diagnosis. So a medical diagnosis can only be given by a doctor or another specially trained clinician using the criteria that's already been covered with you in the other parts of your webinar series. Once you have a diagnosis, it might mean your child is eligible for special education services. And that's because in education, we have an educational eligibility. And in order to get an educational eligibility, a team of professionals, which includes you, the child's parent, because you're the professional on your child, uh, determines a student is eligible by both being identified as meeting one of the disability criteria, which autism is one, and the child has to be in need of specialized services under IDEA. And so the eligibility under the category of autism is really the impact of the disability on learning. So we're going to start with uh, going over a little bit of federal legislation and the timelines that we have. Um, I've already used an acronym, IDEA, that's the Individuals with Disabilities Act, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. It was reauthorized in 2004. But we're going to start with the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, also known as Section 504. Section 504 is applicable to students in the public school setting because it's a civil rights law which prohibits discrimination of individuals with disabilities in all programs that receive federal funding. And public schools receive federal funding. Uh, we also have the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, it's probably one of the acronyms people are familiar with. 
1990, and that is a law that guarantees equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities in many things, including education. However, specific to education, we have IDEA, which I've already mentioned, and we also have IDEIA, the Individuals with Disabilities Educational Improvement Act of 2004. And IDEIA uh, reaffirmed the rights that were provided from the federal legislation for children with disabilities to receive an appropriate public education. Um, under the federal law, special education means specially designed instruction at no cost to the parent to meet the unique needs of individuals with exceptional needs, including related services and transition services for children who are 16 and above. Under IDEIA, uh, four basic rights were given to all children with disabilities. And in order to guarantee these rights, IDEIA outlines two protections. So the first right that is guaranteed is what's called FAPE, and that's the free appropriate public education. So children with disabilities who meet special education eligibility criteria are entitled to a public education that's free for their families. Uh, the next is least restrictive environment or LRE. And what LRE means is that each public agency must ensure that to the maximum extent possible that children with disabilities are educated with students who do not have disabilities. Um, and LRE strives to serve students with disabilities in what we always call the least restrictive environment. And we will get to that. There's a full continuum of services that a school team looks at. Supplementary aids and services are also called related services. These are things that if your child gets an IEP, you'll see as a part of the IEP. Uh, and it talks about children with disabilities must be provided aids and services and other supports in regular classes or other education related settings uh, and in extracurricular and non-academic settings to enable each child to be educated with non-disabled peers to the maximum extent possible. And then finally, the last right that IDEA and IDEA guarantee is the right to assessment. And an assessment must be completed to determine the needs of a child in all areas of suspected disability. And this can only be done with a parent or guardian's informed consent. So prior to doing a formal evaluation, you have to sign consent to that assessment. Uh, after an initial assessment, a child must be reassessed at least once every three years to determine their continued need for eligibility. And when a school team is doing an assessment, they cannot rely on only one area or one mode of an assessment measure. So they cannot just give one test or they cannot just give one observation. It has to be a comprehensive look at the child. And one of the things you'll see is if you go through an assessment process is that the parent is involved. And so when an assessment happens, um, you're going to get homework. And it's not bad homework. It's just that the school team needs your input and they need to collect some data from you in order to make the, de the determination for your child. And then IDEA gives the two protections that I mentioned. So the first protection is due process. Uh, due process is described in the legal procedural safeguards. So procedural safeguards are notifications that are given to parents. Um, they're designed to ensure that parents provide informed consent regarding the special education programs offered. And uh, due process is a mechanism for families and school districts to resolve arguments. And then the second protection is the IEP, another acronym that you're probably familiar with, and it stands for Individualized Educational Program. So an IEP must occur at least annually, so at least once a year for an identified student with a disability, and it's comprised of a team. Uh, the IEP also happens once every three years for the triennial when the assessment is due, and parents have the right to request an IEP at any time. So if there's a concern that you have, you request that of your school team. And then IDEA also has something called Part C. And so under FAPE, uh, children with a disability from birth to 22 years old have the right to uh, FAPE. However, the school districts, we aren't as involved with this piece for infants and toddlers. And so that's what Part C of IDEA covers. Uh, I'm not going to go into that too much tonight, but I am going to provide you a resource so that if you would like to know more about it, it will be included in that resource. Uh, I believe it's going to be emailed to you with these slides after the presentation. 
So as I've talked about, we have multiple paths to support individuals with autism in the educational setting. Uh, one of the paths is child find. That's a legal requirement that schools find all children who have disabilities and may be eligible for special education services. I mention this because it's noted that all students are entitled to this homeschool students, students enrolled in private schools. And so one of the ways that school districts do this is uh, we might reach out to these entities, we might have meetings with them or trainings and other things, uh, but it is something important for you to know. Another path can be that a school team recognizes that there might be some concerns that need to be looked into. And also the family might be noticing concerns that they have with their child and alert the school to those concerns. Oh, I, oh shoot, I apologize. I had had this handy thing where when I clicked on this table, it would pop up bigger for you. Uh, but this is the special education process timeline. So it's a pretty important timeline for you. I've included the link here. It's also gonna be included in the booklet that you'll get as a resource um, after the presentation. And I also have a link to that booklet at the end of the presentation. Um, but it talks here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over it just briefly. And this is that the very first thing that happens in the special education process is that there's a referral made. And this referral can be made by parents or guardians. It can be made by teachers if your child's in school. It can be made by um, other agencies. So if your child is a client of Inland Regional Center, they can make a referral to the district. Um, or anybody that's familiar with the child can initiate this referral process. And then what happens from the referral process is the school district has 15 days to respond. Um, and what they must do is get together what this document calls a problem solving, a problem -solving team. But in our area, we typically call this a student study team. And we're gonna go into what this looks like. Um, but this is an important thing that you'll wanna look at because it has all of the legal timelines that special education is bound to as you move through this process with your child. So as I mentioned, once a referral is made for a student to uh, be referred for special education services, general education has a legal requirement that they first have to try interventions. So one of the things I'm gonna point out to you right now is special education is a spectrum. And so a lot of the things we're gonna talk about tonight is that there's all kinds of things that have to be done. Um, there's also like a pyramid. So we have to look at tier one interventions. So interventions that can be used on any child in the school setting. Uh, tier two interventions are gonna be things that are a little more restrictive. Uh, and tier three interventions come after that. So these are things that are gonna to apply to a much smaller a percentage of the population in order for these children to access the environment. So one of the things that we're bound to do in special education, as we talked about before, is to always be looking at the participation in general education for any child who has a disability. And so because of that, before we jump to the restrictiveness of identifying a child with special education, general education must first try interventions collect data on those interventions, and then determine if those interventions are effective or not. Um, so one of the things that's been designed to do this is the student study team. Uh, the student study team happens typically at a school site, and you'll have a, a child's teacher who knows the child, uh, the parents or guardians or other people who are familiar with the child participate in that meeting, and often an administrator or other professionals who may know the child will be invited and this team comes together and they start to look at the data. So they look at the child's strengths, they look at areas of concern or areas where the child is struggling, uh, they talk about interventions that have already been tried, and they come up with a plan of interventions to try to support the child. Once they try these interventions, the team comes back and either the team decides, yes, these interventions are working, uh, we're not gonna need more restrictive um, services or we don't need to progress up to another tier. Um, however, if they do decide to progress, then a referral is made for evaluation. Um, you also might have a child who is not in school yet. And so an SS team can be formed with a district personnel. So it's also gonna have people who know the child and they're gonna talk about what it is that the child needs. So we are gonna focus on what happened right now we're going to focus on what happens after this referral is made to special education um, and this is the iep an iep has a lot of legislation and a lot of um, i think kind of overwhelming information around it when you're first getting into this process um, we could do out 
more than an hour on an IEP alone, but I'm going to give you the condensed version and I'm going to give you some strategies uh, as you navigate the IEP. So an IEP meeting, as I mentioned before, must happen um, after there's been informed consent for evaluation. So once you sign and return consent to evaluate your child for special education, um, this consent you are provided in writing where the child will be, what areas the child will be evaluated in, who will be conducting the evaluations. And once we receive that back, we have 60 days in which to conduct the assessments and then convene an IEP team meeting where we can talk about the results of the assessments. So after the initial IEP, as I mentioned before, you have to have an annual IEP, which is at least once a year, and a triennial IEP where the child is evaluated again, and that has to happen at least once every three years. And again, as I mentioned before, a parent has a right to call an IEP meeting at any time. Um, but those are the minimum frequencies for IEPs. When a school district is uh, planning an IEP meeting, so they're talking to everybody and seeing when people are available, talking to you about when you're available for this meeting, you will be sent uh, an invitation and that's called a notice of meeting. And this invitation goes out to you, it specifies the day, the time, where the meeting will be. It's gonna specify who will be in attendance at this meeting and then you return it to the district. So if you can't attend that day and time, then the district's gonna work with you to find a mutually agreeable date and time. If you need a translator to attend this meeting for you or for someone else who you'd like to bring, you're gonna note that on the IEP notice of meeting. If you want to record the meeting, there's a space to indicate that as well. So you just return that, um, it's a line of communication and it's your RSVP to this meeting. Um, at an IEP, we have federal mandates on who must be in attendance, or state mandates, but it's in the California Education Code, who must attend the IEP. So the required team members at an IEP are the parent or guardian or educational rights holder, uh, the general education teacher, the special education teacher, a, an LEA rep. So that's local educational agency representative. If you're in a school district, it's typically an administrator from your district. Uh, like the principal or the assistant principal, or it could be somebody from the district level that comes um, to your meeting. And if there are any assessments done, it's going to be whoever conducted assessment. So at an initial IEP, you'll have a school psychologist there. If the area of occupational therapy is being assessed or speech, then you're going to have an OT or an SLP in attendance as well. And then one of the things you're able to do is invite anybody whom you would like to attend the meeting. If you would like your home ABA provider, if you have one to attend that meeting, you're welcome to do so. Uh, if you want your mom to come with you, if you have a mother that you'd like to have come, you can have her come. We just ask that you inform us on your notice of meeting who you're going to be bringing. Um, and they can come and they can sit at the table and then you're given the procedural safeguards. And the procedural safeguards are, uh, we reviewed those a little bit, there's some of the rights given to you under IDEA, but a school district must provide you written procedural safeguards at least once a year. Uh, if you're a veteran to this process, many school districts that I've been a part of give them to you at every meeting, um, but we have to do it once a year. So the IEP process is where we're gonna head next. Um, this is a nice flow chart. I borrowed it from Desert Mountain Selpa and I gave them credit here, but it's a nice flow chart of where we're going to be going next. And we're going to start with eligibility. So as I mentioned, every, at an initial or every three years, the district has to conduct formal and informal assessments in order to determine if a child is eligible for special education services and also if they're requiring specialized academic instruction and modifications um, in order to be eligible. So we review the data and we determine all the present levels for a child and the team has a discussion on if they're eligible or not. And when I say the team, I want you to make sure that you understand that you are an equal member of this team. So um, you can bring your insight, you can ask questions, uh, you can participate in the conversation to determine whether your child is eligible or not. If your child, I'm gonna start with not eligible. If your child is not eligible for special education services, the IEP process, it's gonna end. Um, but if your child is eligible, then the IEP process continues. So if your child is not eligible, they may be eligible for a 504 plan. And as we talked about before, the 504 is because of the Rehabilitation Act. 
um, and that's where 504s come out of. So they're a federally protected plan, and the IEP team refers the student back to the student study team because they have to determine if the child is now eligible for 504. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to understand are the difference between accommodations and modifications. And one of the reasons that I think this is important is because it's crucial in determining a pathway uh, to support a child with autism in the educational environment. Um, and it's not always the case, but one nice way to think about it is if a child only needs accommodations um, and accommodations or strategies utilized to support an individual in accessing information or accessing the curriculum and standards, then they might not need an IEP if all they need is accommodations. They might just need a 504 or maybe they don't need anything at all. Maybe they're accessing the curriculum. However, when we get to a student who needs modifications, uh, we're modifying the curriculum or we're changing the standard for them. That's usually a time that child's going to need an IEP. So some examples of accommodations, and you can Google this because there are hundreds. Um, I listed a couple here. There's extra time to complete an assignment. There's March text. There are students um, who get notes provided to them ahead of time. Uh, for example, it might be that you got my PowerPoint before I ever started talking. Uh, the child might need extra prompts or extra visuals in order to access the curriculum. A uh, common one I see on a lot of IEPs is preferential seating. Um, this can mean a lot of things and you can actually specify this. So does your child need to sit in the front? Does your child need to sit away from an air conditioning vent because the sound uh, interferes with the processing ability? Um, it can mean all kinds of things and you can specify that. Um, and modifications are, like I mentioned, anytime you're going to change that standard. Uh, so that could be or you're going to modify the workload for a child. So instead of doing the whole assignment, they only do five questions. Uh, it could be that when the rest of the class is doing an essay assignment or the standard is to be writing paragraphs or sentences, that your child's going to have a word bank of choices so that they can use that word bank to answer their test questions. Um, it's targeting just a portion of the standard instead of the whole standard. I'm not really going to get into the California standards right now, but some of them are pretty lengthy. And so your child might need to be first targeting a foundational portion of that standard before they're getting to the whole standard. And so that's considered a modification. And um, so one of the things to note about a five, well, we covered this because like I said, it helps determine whether your child might need a 504 plan or an IEP. It's not the sole criteria, but it's something that I wanted you to know about as you're considering what your child uh, might need or what you might want to research a little more or ask me questions about. So it is important to note that a student in the educational environment does not have both a 504 and an IEP. Uh, this is a pretty common misconception that I've run into. Um, if your student has an IEP, they don't have a 504 because they already have all these protections in an IEP. Um, in fact, if you look at an IEP, it has all the accommodations that a student might need that might have been covered in a 504. That's already embedded in the IEP. Um, and if a student has a 504, then they're not also going to have an IEP. So you have one or the other. Um, and that's because not all the students, as I mentioned, not all students with disabilities require that specialized instruction. Some just need accommodations. Uh, I know we're here talking about autism, but a student with a visual impairment, they might need Braille, and that's all they need to access their educational environment. Um, and so if that's all you need and it can be accommodated in a 504, then that's what the school team is going to look at providing. Um, as I mentioned before, a 504 plan is a general education function. So if your student has a 504, they're not classified or tracked by the state as being a special education student. Um, a 504 is a federally protected document. As I mentioned before in a previous slide, 504s cover all kinds of settings, education being just one of them. So that document can continue after the student's public education experience. The reason I note this is because an IEP doesn't. So an IEP ends once a student is finished with public education, and that's upon graduation from high school or aging out of special education services at the age of 22. And then, like we already talked about, a 504 plan is going to specify all those accommodations that the student is requiring, and it should be updated by the school site team annually. And you're a part of that, as I mentioned. You can be a part of that process. 
So let's jump back to IEPs. Now, if your child is eligible for an IEP, you've gone over the evaluations, you've determined the present levels, and in determining the present levels, you've identified what areas that the child needs specific goals. Because your child might not need goals in every area, or they might. Like I mentioned, it's a whole spectrum. It's tailored and it's individualized to your child. So the school team looks at the present levels in order to drive the goals for the child um, and the evaluation, because the evaluation drives the present levels, the present levels drive the goals. And so um, whenever we're looking at writing goals, we want the goals to be specific to the child. They have to be measurable, attainable, they have to be relevant, and they're bound by time. So when you look at an IEP document, every goal has a baseline because you have to know where you're gonna start out in order to know where you're going. Now, as I mentioned before, an IEP is a document that's updated annually. So very commonly, goals are gonna be written for a year and it's how much progress we wanna see the child make in one year. It's gonna specify any accommodations uh, that the child might have, such as if your child is going to write, let's say your child is able to write one sentence and the goal is by next year, they're gonna write two paragraphs and they require um, some visual supports like maybe a sentence starter or um, the use of a visual outline, then that's gonna be written into the goal. However, other strategies such as teaching methodologies, they are not specified in goals. And one of the reasons for that is because what if that doesn't work um, for that particular child? Um, teachers need the flexibility so that they can try different curricula or different strategies with different children. However, to be measurable, we need to know pieces about what the standard is for targeting, uh, what supports the student is going to be given to meet that goal, um, what percentage of time we want that done, uh, and then at what point are we expecting the student to meet that goal. Um, so after the team talks about and decides upon all the goals, you're going to consider some things called special factors that looks at what kind of assistive technology might your child require. Um, if it's assistive, assistive technology that they require, is it already met in their current classroom environment? Uh, it looks at things such as low incidence disabilities. So the low incidence disabilities that are identified are orthopedically impaired, visually impaired, and hearing impaired. Um, and if your child is not, we just check the no box. It looks at all, all different things. It also looks at testing because as I mentioned before, the public education system, we have to look at the data, right? So in the evaluation, we look at data. Uh, the state looks at data. You, I'm sure you've heard about it, that your state testing, and right now everyone's talking about Common Core. Um, well, everybody has to participate in state testing. Well, there's some caveats, but everyone has to participate in state testing when they get to their, their appropriate grade level. And so if your child needs any accommodations or modifications in that testing, then the special factors, are, um, that's where we define those things that the child is needing. So once we look at all that picture, we are gonna talk about in the IEP, the continuum of services and placement. So again, we are back to a sliding scale for students. And so, as I mentioned, we are always go from the least restrictive environment or no services or no modifications, no, um, nothing that's done outside of what's done for everybody else. And that's up here as the general education class. And then we go all the way down to most restrictive, sorry, excuse me. Um, and most restrictive, we look at that as things as instruction in a non-classroom setting or home hospital. Um, so it has a full continuum of services here. And we consider those things. And then we start a conversation about, we don't choose that yet. We just understand what they are. So I can give you a brief overview in case you need it. Um, general education class with supplemental services and aids is something. So that's where a student's participating all day in their general education class and they're just needing those um, related services that we talked about in an earlier slide. We have general education where you have consultation or collaboration from special education staff. So that might be that your child has um, a special education teacher that's collaborating with their general education teacher on some different strategies that can be used in the classroom. We have general education 
with specialized academic instruction in the classroom. So that could be that a special education teacher pushes into the classroom. It could be that a special education teacher co-teaches with a general education teacher. It could be where you have a special education staff member um, who comes in and provides some additional support to the student in a general education class. We have where students participate in a general education class for most of the day, but then they're pulled out for a portion of the day in order to get some specialized academic instruction. Uh, here you see it called the pullout model. Um, that's because the child's pulled out of general education for a little bit in order to receive that specialized academic instruction. Uh, and it's important to note that this specialized academic instruction can also be other pullout services. So if your child has to be pulled out for speech, um, that's time away from the general education class. And the school district is always going to look at how much time does the child really need to miss out of their general education class? Because we're mandated um, under the other things we've been talking about under these major, major federal laws that affect special education, we're mandated to try to be educating children with disabilities alongside their non-disabled peers to the maximum extent possible. So we have to look at, is the service that they're getting, is that required for them to be away from their general education peers? And so that's why we look at all these different options. Um, we move all the way down to the continuum of students who are in a separate classroom for a majority of their day. Um, this particular slide says it's mild moderate. I pulled this chart off of the uh, resource manual that you're going to get. It's from the Riverside County SELPA office. Um, that's who I work under. We work under the Riverside County SELPA. I anticipated that if you're participating in this webinar, you might be from this area. Um, and so you're free to look that up. If you don't see your district in the end of that, um, you can call your district office and ask them for their SELPA's manual. But, um, this says mild moderate. That's not always what we call everything, but they're using some layman's terms in this flow chart. Um, but mild moderate typically, and don't take this as the golden standard, but mild moderate special day classrooms are typically classrooms where the special education teacher is teaching the child for a majority of the day, and they have the flexibility to be able to modify or to um, accommodate some of the state standards. And they'll do this in ways of changing pacing, um, providing more repetition to students, utilizing a lot more of the uh, specialized academic instruction strategies that they have in their tool belt um, in order to teach the children. And that's because a general education teacher and a special education teacher are credentialed differently. Um, and so the special education teacher, they're really the experts on all these different ways to accommodate students with different learning styles in the classroom. Uh, and so that's typically what's referred to as a mild moderate classroom. And then we also have on here what's typically referred, referred to as a moderate severe classroom. That's when you're looking at a classroom which is utilizing completely um, modified state standards. So we call that an alternate curriculum. Um, a lot of times that's because a student is meeting a standard that has been spiraled down to their individual level in order to access what it is the children um, are required to learn in that grade level. Um, and then we're going to see some other things like state special schools and non-public schools. I'm not going to get into that as much unless you have a specific question about it um, because it's not that common because it's so restrictive um, for children to have as well as the home hospital and the non-classroom setting. So it's important to know about this continuum because as the team starts to talk about accommodations and modifications and services, the team's going to use that information to have a discussion about where a child's going to fit on this continuum of services and placement. And that happens at the very end. Um, one of the things I see a lot um, on whoever, whomever's part it is, is that people want to come into an IEP and talk about placement first. Well, where are you going to put my child? Or another team member might say, like, well, where are we going to put the child? Just as I mentioned that the evaluation drives the present levels, the present levels drive the goals, the goals are going to drive the services. Um, and all of the services that are talked about, services and accommodations and modifications and supplemental aids, those are what's going to drive placement for the child in the discussion that you have. Um, so some additional things to note about an IEP are that the local educational agency offers 
the free and appropriate public education. And so that's why there's an administrator or a representative there from your local educational agency. Um, I note this because I work for the County Office of Education. So whenever I attend a meeting, the LEA is always there um, because we work with other school districts to provide services to students in special education. And so we participate in that discussion, but the LEA is the one that offers FAPE. So after all the discussions, the LEA must determine what it is they're going to offer you as the parent um, on behalf of your child. And as the parent, you have to provide the consent before the district and the service providers implement any of that IEP. And if you don't want to consent at the moment, you don't have to. If you want to think about it, you can go home, you can rest on it, you can talk to some other people. Um, and it's not an all or nothing. So you're able to consent to portions of the IEP. So for example, if you agree with all the goals, you can agree to all the goals. If you agree with two of the goals, you can agree with two of the goals. And there's a section on the IEP where you can sign to that and you can talk about what it is you agree with. Um, there might be something you disagree with. You can note that you disagree. Uh, it might be that in the moment you agree with a portion of it, but you wanna consider another portion. You don't have to necessarily disagree to only agree with portions of the IEP. Um, but the school district can't implement anything that is presented to you without your consent. So no new goals can be implemented, no new services can be implemented, no change of placements can be implemented without your signed consent. Um, it's also important to note the notification of progress on goals. So school districts are bound to notify you of the progress your child is making on their individual goals. And that has to line up with the general education progress reports. And then as we've already talked about, um, the timeline for IEPs. So that is your crash course in 504s and IEPs. Um, as I mentioned, you can ask any questions you want at the end of the presentation. But one of the things I was asked to do is to come and talk to you about strategies that can be used uh, with this, for you to come in line with the school program and support a child who has autism. Um, so I'm going to start with this short. Oh, it's not going to play. No, I apologize. I didn't know the platform wouldn't play my video clip. Um, but the very first thing that I would say in working with your child's team is that communication and collaboration are key. Um, you, as I mentioned, you as the parent or the guardian or the educational rights holder, you are an integral part of the team and what you say matters. And so there's a lot of strategies that you can use when communicating and collaborating with the school team. Um, and I'll give you some of them. There's a whole bunch and you can use what works for you and what your communication style and your communication preferences. Um, so one of the things to do is to establish that relationship with your child's service providers. So talk to the teachers, find out how your child's doing in class, share what your concerns are and, and see if what you're seeing is the same as what's being seen in school. Um, sometimes, especially for our children who have ASD or who are on the spectrum, they're going to have certain behaviors in school and certain behaviors in home, and sometimes they line up and sometimes they don't. So when you're communicating with the school team, um, maybe we're seeing a behavior that you don't. And so we're going to talk to you like, well, what, it, what is it that you're doing? And we might try to find out what strategies you're employing so that we can use those at school. Um, or vice versa. Maybe you're seeing something at home and we don't see it at school. And so we want to be on that same page and we really want to work with you. Um, the goal that we all have is the success of your child. I assure you, nobody goes into special education without a true love for the children. Um, I assure you that's my part. I love children with ASD. I, like I mentioned before, I love um, working with people who have autism. Um, and you'll see that as you go through the school, I believe. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, there are clashes that people have with one another. Um, and that's a lot of times a communication breakdown. And so keeping those open lines of communication are important. With that, I've been in a lot of IEPs that I've never counted. Um, but when I go to the doctor with my daughter, I find it daunting. And that's one person I'm talking to. When you come into an IEP meeting, you're going to have a lot of people, a lot of specialists that are sitting around the table talking about your child. And I can only imagine that that might be daunting, at least for me. So some other strategies that you can do are things like 
you can request a copy of the evaluation report before you get to the IEP. And that way you have a chance to read it at home. Um, if that's not your style, like I mentioned, you can have it shared with you there. You can always take the report home and you can read it later. Um, you can write all your questions down. That's always a great strategy to have. Write all your questions and concerns down so that when you're in the meeting, uh, you can make sure that all of your points are addressed. Um, you can even communicate prior to the meeting. So before you ever get to the meeting, you can share where, uh, what areas you'd like to see goals written in. So maybe you've seen that your child is needing specific help with something. You can share what it is you've seen or, or um, have the school team collect data in that specific area. And you can talk about a goal there. Um, one of the pieces that's embedded in the IEP process, which I apologize, I, I didn't cover because when I have an IEP, the very first thing I do after we do introductions and after I offer you the copy of your procedural safeguards is I ask what your concerns are as the parent. That's the very first thing we cover because I want to make sure that not only do we record your concerns, but that we talk about every single one of your concerns through the course of the meeting. Um, if you have a concern in the area of communication, we're going to be sure that we talk about uh, what your child is doing in the area of communication, how much progress they've made in that area, where we need to develop goals, or maybe what additional strategies might need to be implemented for your child, um, and make sure that all your concerns are addressed. Um, so there's a couple strategies in the area of communication. Um, I think it's important that you review some of the data before you come into IEP, um, because that gives you a fair advantage. Every I've reviewed it. If I come to your child's IEP meeting, I've reviewed their data. Uh, their teachers reviewed their data. And then that way, you know exactly where your child was last year. You have a clear understanding of where they are this year um, and maybe where you're going to go. You also have the right to record your child's meeting. So it's funny that actually that I'm a little bit nervous with this webinar because I've been in so many IEPs that are recorded that I feel like I'm recorded all the time. Um, but I guess usually there's no video. So you have the right to record your child's IEP meeting. You just have to provide written notice of that um, intent to record 24 hours before the meeting. Um, and then you're able to record. I will note just that if you want to record the meeting, just bring out your, you know, you tell us, bring out your recorder and say like, okay, are we ready? I'm going to record. Um, because you can't record, even though you provide notice, you still can't sit in a room and record people without their consent. Um, but typically the district's going to record as well. Um, but that's something you can have if you want to go ahead and review the notes later or review what was talked about later. Um, and I think those are some, some good strategies to be using there. I apologize again that the clip didn't play. Um, in a nutshell, it's a video clip about how communication can break down when we're having some nonverbal cues or, or not understanding the other person's perspective. Um, so as I mentioned, there are some times where we have conflict between families and the school district. And so there is a hierarchy to follow whenever you want to resolve conflicts over your child's education. And I've included this flow chart. Again, it's in the handout that's going to be at the end of the presentation. And we always say that first and foremost, you should talk to your child's teacher. Um, a lot of things can be resolved if you talk directly to the person you see the most. I think that applies in all aspects in life. I'm not an expert in that part, so don't quote me. Um, but it goes from the teacher to the school psychologist, to the site administrator. If you can't resolve it at the site, go to the district. Um, and it walks you through everybody at the district. If the district is not able to resolve it, you can go to the SELPA. If the SELPA is not able to resolve it, you can go to the state level. All of these things um, are outlined in the packet I'm going to give you. And also, all these things are outlined in your procedural safeguards, which you get every year. So every year, you'll have updated contact information if you ever needed to progress through different um, rungs of resolving the conflict on the hierarchy scale. So before we start the question and answer, I just wanted to talk, leave you with the thought that in education, um, we're shifting from equality. So we don't want everybody to have the same thing. That's never been what special education is about. Um, we're about equity. So we're always looking at what is it that your individual child is needing in order to access the educational environment. And it's that access that's the key. What is it that they need to be able to access the environment? It's always on the forefront of our minds. Uh, this is a copy of the resource you're going to get. 
And with that, that's the end of my presentation. And I'd love to hear any questions. We actually do have a comment um, that was said while you were presenting and it's from Johnny Drawn. And they just wanted to let you know um, that you were doing a great job thus far. So that's thanks. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for watching. Yeah, so if anybody has thank any questions or comments they want to leave in the chat box, webinar. right now is the time to do so. Um, I actually had a couple questions sent to me beforehand. Um, but one question that I do have for you, Randy, um, in the meantime, while we wait for any questions, um, is what does transitioning my child from special education to a mainstream classroom um, look like? Uh, well, there's a couple of different answers to the question. So if you're the person that asked, maybe if you can specify in the chat box, because you can have a child who is identified as a special education student who's in the general education classroom. Special education is not a place, it's a service. And so we talked about the continuum of service options. Uh, a child can have some consultation or some collaboration or some of those push-in services. I think that um, a general tip that I would give, especially from my experience in working with individuals who have autism, is just an area of transition in general. So if you're going to make any sort of a change, whether it maybe you're increasing mainstreaming, and that's what this question um, is targeting in the amount of time, like you're increasing the amount of time your students spending in general education, I would say that have a plan. Um, students with autism typically don't do that well with change. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to use some strategies for the student to make sure that they're successful. Uh, you'll know your student the best. That might be social stories, that might be priming, uh, that might be visiting the class when nobody's there. Um, it might be looking at the best place to start the mainstreaming or start the time in a general education class. Um, if your child loves math and you might want the very first portion of an increase to be in math. So always looking at what's going to make the student the most successful mm -hmm. and having an intentional um, plan. So I actually wanted to add transition. into that. How would you um, assist maybe a high school student that's graduating um, from high school and transitioning out of school? Okay. Um, so there's a lot of services. And one of the things that we have to do in education is we have to hold an exit IEP. So whenever a student is going to exit special education and one of the ways to exit is to get your diploma is that the IEP team is going to come together and they're going to talk about that exit. A large part to answer that question is what the child wants to do after they graduate. So if the student um, wanted to go to college, we're going to have some recommendations there versus if they wanted to go get a job. But even before you get to that point, things that I covered is that the law requires us to do transition planning for students once they turn 16. So uh, once a child turns 16 or a student turns 16, there's a portion of the IEP called the ITP, the Individual Transition Plan. And so the school team does an assessment with the student. It could be an interview. It could be a more assessment. Um, and they're going to determine what it is the child wants to do. And they specific goals to prepare the student for that transition. So I believe that is the end of our Q&A. Um, as I um, stated in the beginning of the webinar, I will go ahead and send the presentation to everybody as well as um, a wonderful resource that Randy shared with me too. So everybody will be receiving that. I want to go ahead and thank everybody for attending. Um, if you attended all of our webinars or just this one, we want to go ahead and thank you, um, as well as Randy Chapluck. This was a really, really wonderful presentation, very informative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. And um, the only thing I didn't include is if you have questions, you can feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer any questions after. I can just say that and you can write it down. It's not in my presentation right now. Um, I'm sure Bianca can share it with you as well. Uh, my contact information, should you want to contact me, is R-C-H-A-P as in Peter, L-U-K at R-C-O-E dot U-S. And my office number, if you wanted to call me, is 951 
and I'm more than happy to answer any Bye -bye. questions that you may have. Thank you.